is covering sort of the basic types of chemical reactions. And the very first part that they cover is about like, what is it when, like what causes a reaction to occur? Like why does your tools, like nails, if they get wet, okay, why do they get all rusty? Like, so what causes that? Why don't they just stay normal iron? And that's all thermodynamics. So thermodynamics really has to do with the amount of energy. So it's the amount of energy that is required for reactions to occur. Some re reactions require very little energy and they give off a lot of energy. Those tend to be more spontaneous. So like I said, like your shovel rusting or nails rusting, especially if they get wet, iron rusting, ice. If you take ice out of the freezer, it's going to automatically absorb energy from the temperature of the environment and it's going to melt. So it's not going to stay as a solid. It's going to go through its process of melting. And those they consider spontaneous. So just think of things that actually you don't have to do anything to. They're going to happen all by themselves. The wood, so if wood just sits around, sits around eventually because of the wetness and just the sunlight exposure, it just begins to rot. It's sort of a nor normal process. So if there is less energy required, more energy released, this reaction is said to have a negative free energy. Negative, I always think of negative free energy means like more energy comes out than what you actually have to put in, and it tends to be more spontaneous. So they use a symbol for that, they call it delta G, which is not like a huge big thing. It's really just talking about whether or not a reaction is more likely to happen on its own, or is it something like the reactions I have down listed on the bottom. For example, if you make steel. So if you take steel and you put, you have to take iron and chromium, okay? But you can't just set them side by side. If you set them side by side, you're gonna have a stick of iron and a stick of chromium. They're not going to automatically combine, but you have to heat these so that they're molten. And then you mix them and then cool them slowly and that actually produces steel. So that's a huge amount of energy that you have to put in. So the heating and the mixing, not as much energy comes out. Anybody that works out knows that Building muscle requires an awful lot of energy, <laughs> right? It's much easier to lay on the couch, <laughs> okay? So that is not a spontaneous process. Building muscle is not spontaneous. It requires a lot of energy in, so you have to feed the body fuel, and you have to do a lot of resistance training to promote building of muscle proteins within cells. And if you stop doing it, what happens? <laughs> they'll all atrophy again okay so not only do you have to put a lot of energy in to build them you've got to maintain them too so that's a non-spontaneous reaction digestion of glucose with oxygen and carbon dioxide so that is the breaking down of molecules into carbon dioxide and water not an automatic process but we speed those up by using catalysts so we get some things to happen that don't otherwise happen on their own. Making ice, right? So if you put water in your ice cube trays, they're not gonna become ice cube trays unless you change the temperature, right? And so you've got to put them in a colder environment to pull energy away from them, to force them into that crystalline structure. So in these, think of these as non-spontaneous. All right, who's pinging? <laughs> non-spontaneous means there's more energy in less energy out, okay? So it takes more energy to build structures. Those don't happen on their own. So oftentimes we have to actually purposely put forth energy to get these types of things to happen. So they say that those delta G values are always positive. And I always think of positive means I've got to put something into it. Negative, I'm going to get something out, but positive, I've got to put something in. So they give the example in the book of like a canoe going downstream, right? You put a canoe in the water and it's just gonna follow the flow. There's less energy involved with paddling downstream. <laughs> you can kind of just sit in the canoe and be like, yeah, <laughs> stick your feet out, sun. <laughs> uh -huh. Drag your little cooler behind you. It's like, it's easy, okay? But if you get in and you're like, oh, we gotta paddle five miles upstream, 
what? Because <laughs> then you're constantly fighting the normal flow, not a spontaneous process. Okay, so just think about like different aspects that things happen all on their own. Those tend to be spontaneous and they tend to require less energy, tend to give off more energy or more, less energy is required to get them going. So you can also look at it and list it by ender and exergonic. So when you're talking about gonic, you're really talking about energy. Okay, so if it's spontaneous, then energy is released. So that is exergonic. And so you can think of energy or heat as being a product. So if energy is on the right side of the reaction, then that means that heat is released as a product. Whereas the bottom one, if energy is required, then that means you've got to put heat in. So there's energy required. That tends to be not spontaneous. Okay, so the top one shows the rusting. Iron combining with oxygen making iron oxide, which is rust. The bottom one shows, has anybody ever used a cold, a cold smack bag, okay, like an like a ice bag or a cold pack that has crystals inside in this little pouch, and you smack it and shake it, and then it gets cold and it stays cold for hours. So what that is, the crystals inside is ammonium nitrate, okay? So the NH4, NO3, remember that NH4 is the ammonium, NO3 is nitrate. So these crystals, what you do is you're, you smack them and that allows, so there's like crystals inside, then there's a little bladder of water. So you smack it so that then those crystals begin to dissolve. So they go from being a solid to being aqueous. As they do, they absorb energy. And so the cold pack gets colder and colder and colder. And so it maintains that as long as that ammonium nitrate is hydrating, is dissolving in the water, over four to six hours, they'll constantly absorb heat, and anything that absorbs heat is gonna feel cold, right? Because it's absorbing heat as part of the reaction rather than heat being given off. Heat being given off, heat is going to be a product, and so things tend to feel warmer, may even feel hot, like if you're burning wood, heat is a product. But in this one with ammonium nitrate, heat is a reactant, and so it creates the cold pack. So we kind of take advantage of that. So it says it's not spontaneous, but it still occurs because it gets the energy from where? The, the environment, the external environment. So if you didn't have that heat, nothing would happen. Okay, but because it can absorb energy from other things, then it will happen. So there's sort of a difference between not being spontaneous and not happening at all. Okay, something that's not spontaneous, you can add energy in and make it happen but it's gonna require energy from somewhere. So another way to look at it is in this one. So in this one, can you see, maybe, in the first one, if the little, the little gray would go away. There, okay. So in the first one, so the level you start with right here, that's sort of the energy level of the reactants. Do you see that the amount of energy you have to put in is less than the amount of energy you give out, you get out, okay? You're always gonna have a certain amount of energy you have to put in, no matter what the reaction is. This is considered exergonic because the products are at a lower energy level than the reactants. So once the reaction occurs, you get more energy out than you had to put in, and this tends to be the spontaneous reaction. So this, the energy out, can oftentimes turn around and power another reaction. It becomes sort of a self-sustaining reaction, like what happens when you burn wood. So when you light wood, you do have to give it some energy. You have to give it that spark to get it started. But once you light it, the energy out is enough to continue this reaction until all of the reactant is gone. Exergonic, energy out. And if you get enough energy out, you can actually make it self-sustaining. But over here, notice the difference. So here, the reactant's energy is very low. You have to put a lot of energy in to get the reaction to occur. So you think of the hill. So notice the difference in the hills. So in the right side, that's a steep hill. You gotta put a lot of energy to roll that ball up over that hill. And then when you're done, you don't get as much energy out. So more energy gets put in compared to what is released. That's the endergonic reaction. So can you see how the second one is not necessarily going to keep going? 
because it's always like losing or using up energy. So if you can't constantly supply more and more energy, it won't keep on happening. And so this is the one where they say if the delta G is negative, it tends to be more spontaneous. But if that delta G is positive, then you're actually using it more energy than you're getting out. And that tends to be less optimal or less spontaneous. So this, this term, most people have heard of this, activation energy. Just by definition, the activation energy, by looking at each of these, the activation energy is the energy that you need to do what? To start a reaction, right? And it doesn't matter if it's exergonic or if it's endergonic. It doesn't matter if it's a big hill or a little hill. There is a hill of energy that you have to put into a reaction in order to get that reaction to start. So what's that based on? That is based on a couple of things, if it will let me go. Okay? So this activation energy, okay? The amount of energy you have to put in to make a reaction occur. And it's really based on two things. Collisions, because clearly things have to come in contact with one another for a reaction to occur. And orientation. So you also have to put molecules together in the right orientation in order to get them to occur. And so they sort of show the both here. Okay, so one, if we have A plus B makes C, right? So here's A and here's B, and we want to make C. So one issue is we've got to get A and B to collide, because if they're like, they never come in contact, right? So it's like people that live in your town, you're like, I just never met them, okay? You know, you would think in this little town that I would have met everybody, but there's sometimes you're just, you don't collide with people, so you don't meet them. Same thing, so you need to get reactants to come in. They have to get close enough. They have to physically collide. But they can't just collide and then that's it. They have to collide at the right orientation. So if you notice, A and B, their shape, if they collide this way, they don't fit. They don't match. And so you can think of it as being kind of like a lock and a key. If they don't fit in the correct orientation, nothing happens. They just bounce off of each other. So these are like, like they call them ineffectual collisions. <laughs> so they just sort of bounce off of each other because they don't fit right. I always think of Legos, right? So you can set as many Legos as you want side by side. Are they going to stick together? No, you got to stack them, right? And so that orientation allows them to then begin to stick, and then they can be like one big piece. But you can't just have them side by side. You've got to have some way of interlocking them. Same thing here. You have to have the shape of the two reactants come together correctly in order to react and form a product. Is this sort of like with the biological substrate and you have to have yeah. a product? Yeah, because it leads into that. Okay. <laughs> so we're, go we're going in that direction. So one of the things that they throw in this chapter, and they like to do this in this book, is just like, well, let's just throw a topic in. So they talk about energy and food, okay? So this is the amount of energy contained, can be measured using what is known as a calorimeter. And we actually used a very rudimentary calori calorimeter in class. If you're an online lab person, you'll do like a very rudimentary calorimeter and burn some marshmallows. But the ones that we did, we like burned nuts in lab. And so in this, we measured what are known as nutritional calories. Well, a nutritional calorie is actually a kilocalorie. So it's actually equivalent to a thousand little c calories. So a calorie by definition is the amount of energy that's required to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Okay, so that's like how they came up with their nice standard number, how they said, let's call that a calorie. Okay, all right, so that's where that comes from. So one calorie means that I'm going to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. So two calories would raise one gram two degrees, three calories would be three degrees. So that's, that's how they actually measured that calorie. But when you're talking about food calories, nutritional calories, that's really a thousand of those little calories. So it's the same thing as being a kilocalorie. So you'll see calories in nutritional, it gives you the big C versus the little C. So the little C is sort of the standard metric value. So here's how they do it. 
So in order to be able to figure out exactly how much chemical energy is contained within food, they burn it. So it's using combustion. So they add oxygen and a flame. They ignite the food. They let it burn just like we did with the nut. So you lit your nut and your nut released all this energy. Now theirs is a little different. Notice that all of the heat energy released all goes where? Into the water. Okay, so it is in a chamber that's completely enclosed by water and that water gets circulated so that it's going to absorb that energy evenly and see the thermometer that's there. So you can measure the temperature change and you can figure out how much energy that food sample released based on the temperature change of the water. Because we said we know how much energy water absorbs in that calorie value. So they've determined in food that you've got three basic nutrient groups that contain calories, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. And now lipids, they often will, li people don't know what a lipid is, so they'll just say it's fat. <laughs> because people are like, lipids, what's that? So it's just fats, so it's fats and oils. So when you look at a food listing, you have carbohydrates, proteins, and then, like I said, fats. They'll always list them that way. So carbohydrates, in the next chapter, we're going to talk about them. Carbohydrates includes both your sugars and your starches. So sugars, like sweeteners, soda, candy, okay, all of the small Everything from the milk sugars to the table sugars. And then starches, you're talking about everything that's like flour-based. And so that's going to be all your breads and cereals, your grains, potatoes, pasta. All of those fall into those starches. Now, proteins in general, notice that they just list your typical ones. Really, animal meat is the major source of protein. Why did they put meat? Yes, because <laughs> it's a cold-blooded meat. Because it's a cold-blooded meat, so it's so it's a better it's a better meat compared to the other ones. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why. It's not a mammal, but yeah, that might be. I don't know. It is a meat. Well, then and then they throw in beans. Yeah. Okay. So like in beans and rice, between the two of them, between your grains and your beans, like you get all of the protein that you need in the course of a day. But really meat's the most common one that people think of. Last one, fats. So that would include anything that's an oil. Okay. So olive oil, canola oil, peanut oil, sunflower oil, all of the fancy oils. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are all the oils, everything from your coconut oil all the way to butters. Okay, mm -hmm. avocado over, that's not too bad. Butters, okay, so like regular butter, that's from cow's milk, okay? But you could also have like fats that you get from goat's milk and other types of things. So those, whether solids or liquids, those would all fall into that too, okay? So all of your liquid oils and then all those solid fats. There's a few fats like like fish, fish oil, that's a liquid, that's from an animal. And then there's also like coconut oil and palm oil, which are solids, even though they're from plants. But those are the general ones. The key thing to look at is look at this. And we kind of talked about this when we burned the nuts that night, is look at the calorie difference. Carbohydrates and proteins have the same calorie content per gram. So if you burn a gram of carbohydrate or a gram of protein, you will get four capital C calories, which is like 4,000 little C calories. So we will get four calories per gram that you burn. But if you burn fats, you get more than twice the amount. So we're gonna look a little bit about like how their structure is different and why that's the case. Why do fats have so much more energy per gram? It really has to do with the fact that fats have very little oxygen. Fats are almost all carbons and hydrogen. And so the addition of all that oxygen generates a whole lot more energy. So if you were given something like this, so you decide to get a pack of nabs from the machine. <laughs> so I looked up the numbers. So in the toasty cheese, that's these ones, okay? Aren't they the, no, not tossed. Wait, 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 wait. What toasty cheese nabs have you eaten? Yeah, so if you eat a pack of them, you get 11 grams of protein, 
five grams of fat and 25 grams of total carbohydrate, not split it, okay? So it's not split into sugars and starches. So based on what we said, what's the total calories? So what do you have to do with the 11 grams of protein? Times four. Mm -hmm, times four. So that is 44 calories. What about the five grams of fat? Five times nine. Mm -hmm. 45. Mm -hmm. And then 25 grams of carbohydrate times four. Remember, this is like calories per gram if you were going to set it up with units. So that would be, mm -hmm. so that would be 100. So it's just the number of grams times this calorie per gram. So if you added it up, 4 and 4 is 189. So 4 and 5 is 9, and 4 and 4 is 8, and then 1. So 189 calories in a pack. Okay? And that's like, they're, even though they're salt, right? So you've got sodium because there's like little salt crystals all over the top. There may be some artificial flavors. They may have added some vitamins in there, you know, so they have like enriched flour. So enriched flour means they have some of the B vitamins added to them, but those have no calorie content. Okay. So things like salts, vitamins, they're a nutrient type, but they're not used by the body for energy. The body uses the three basic types for energy. So even though you see salts, even though you may see vitamins, these are no calories. They are not used to generate energy. You still might be watching them because remember that if you ingest too much sodium, what do you end up with? Some puffiness, yeah. Hypertension, all kinds of other issues that get added in. This is a horrible macro ratio. Yes, it is. Well, but this is like this is like the reality of people's lives sometimes. All right. So that's just really where the basic numbers come from. Is they just take the total number of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, multiply them by their values, and then add them up. That's how you figure that out. And you could take a pack of nabs and you could put it in a calorimeter and burn it and calculate how much energy that water absorbed. If you had 100% energy transferred to the water, you would end up calculating that you get 189 calories to burn that entire pack of nabs. It'd be an awful lot. You'd probably burn one nab and multiply it times six. Okay? Now, notice... They talk about foods and they really like to lump foods and say, oh, this is all carbohydrate. Oh, this is all protein. Oh, this is all fat. But what do you see? The vast majority is what? A little bit of everything. Okay. So notice in your apple. So apples you say are mostly what? Mm -hmm. Mostly carbohydrates. Okay. So mostly carbohydrates, but there is a small amount of protein and a small amount of fat. Even though you think of apples, you don't think of fat with an apple. It's a really small amount comparatively, mostly carbohydrates. Breads, mostly carbohydrates, but because it's got a grain, grains are going to have some protein content. So notice that it's got a little bit more than you see with the fruit. So grains and beans are going to have a little more protein, although they're going to be mostly carbohydrate. But what do you see with corn, rice? Mostly what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do note, there is the small amounts of the other. They're not pure carbohydrates. It's just that only about 10% of the nutrients are actually your proteins, and an even smaller amount is those fats. The vast majority is going to be those carbohydrates. Same thing with your rice. So notice, like I'd say like 90% of your calories in rice and your grains come from carbohydrates. About 10% come from protein, and even smaller amounts come from fat. So, what do you notice? What else? Let's see. Juice has no fat. That's what I noticed. <laughs> Here's what I noticed. Juice is what? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's carbs. Has it got any starch in it? Starch comes from grains. So, juice comes from fruits. All of that is simple sugar. 
Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, you need to get a booster glucose. Now, if your A1C is an issue, then that's not such a big plan, right? Then that's the goal to start avoiding. So, eggs, peanut butter, steak. These, not the purple. Eggs, peanut butter, and steak. What do you see equal amounts of? Or closer to? They're higher in protein and fat. fat. Do you notice that? So that your egg, about half and half. So people talk about eggs and they're like, oh, eggs are all have a lot of protein. Well, <laughs> they got a lot of fat in them too. <laughs> okay? So for their relative amount, so notice like if you eat a half a cup of corn or if you only have one egg, not a whole lot of calorie difference, but that's because that egg has so much fat. Fat has nine calories per gram. So you don't need to eat that much fat to bring up those calorie numbers. So notice that most of your protein sources, like eggs, like peanut butter, they have protein, but what do they also have? They have a high concentration of fat. Okay? Same thing with the steak. High in protein, but also high in fat. What's the only one that's just high in fat? The butter. <laughs> Look at the butter. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So the butter is the one that's like, it kind of stands alone. And that is because butter, you, you skim the fat off of the milk and you churn that and that's how you make butter. Okay. So it's basically the cream from milk, which is the stuff that settles out after you milk the cow. It's that cream that is churned in order to make the butter. So it's really very high fat content. All of the other carbohydrates and proteins, all that stuff stayed liquid in the milk and ends up in the milk itself. But the cream part is the part that they use to make butter. So that one's really all kind of by itself. They didn't put like olive oil or anything like that because that would also fall into that really high, high amounts. They don't have very much of the others. But most foods have some of the mix. When you're talking about especially um, your high protein sources, most of those have higher fat sources as well. Low calorie. If you talk about low calorie food, low calorie foods are just compounds, chemicals that you don't digest, but they may add a texture or a flavor that you associate with one of the nutrients. Oh, like artificial sweet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you think of, so um, stevia saccharin, if you think about, well, I guess I skipped that one. The non-sugar, the non-sugar sweeteners, Splenda, the saccharins, the stevia. Stevia is the only one that actually comes from a plant. Um, the other one, the equal aspartame. Mm -hmm. So these are chemicals that don't actually get broken down as an energy source, but when they hit your tongue, they stimulate sweet receptors. So that's why they started using them as artificial sweeteners. And then in one of them, I'm trying to remember which one it was, like, and I'm not sure, it might actually be saccharin that was like accidentally found because it was like a chemical used in industry and someone tasted it and they're like, dude, this is really sweet, taste it. And then, and then someone was like, yes, it really is. And so that like kind of like led to this whole beginning. But, hmm? Yeah, we are. Here, try this. <laughs> All right. But it triggers the sweet receptors on your tongue. It's shape. And not for everybody. How many people can't stand this stuff? How many people like it tastes really bitter? Some people say it tastes bitter. Some people are like, it's not sweet at all. Like it has an aftertaste, like the Diet Cokes and stuff. And so you, some, some people get used to it. That's what they say. Oh, you get used to it. <laughs> There's a myth that they call cane sugar. Uh -huh. Well, the saccharin, like they did tests, but they like tested it on rats and it was really un unreasonable the amount of saccharin they fed you those rats. I mean, they, yes, you would have to eat like pounds of saccharin a day a to be day. equal to what those mice were exposed to because they were like feeding them large amounts for like an animal that, you know, weighs a pound and a half. Aspartame is bad. Mm. What? Aspartame? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know if it goes into formaldehyde. Aspartame is um, what's in equal, and it's actually made from two amino acids. So it's two amino acids. One of them is phenylalanine. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. But the, one of the, like, so it's these two, but the size of the molecule and the fact that when it hits your tongue, it stimulates sweet receptors. The FDA said that was not safe for human consumption when they came out with it. <laughs> and the, soft drink, the National Soft Drink Association said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then when Reagan became president, he put a new head of the FDA, and by executive order, he had the authority to overrule the whole FDA and destroy times one chemical. <laughs> I didn't know that. You have to bring me the research on that. <laughs> there is, well, that's the, that is the reason behind like what those do. But if you don't break it down for energy, so there's also the question of, so you don't, do you absorb it? If you don't break it down, is it absorbed or does it actually end up passing straight through you, kind of like fiber, like what actually happens to them in, in digestion? But they're non considered non-caloric. The other thing is they do stuff like adding texture. So there is, like they'll put things like applesauce and brownies because that helps to give a texture of having more fat. And so by de it decreases the calorie content, but then supposedly also helps in the texture of food. So I don't know if you've heard of this, Olestra, Olestra, <laughs> what they did is they took potato chips. It's really not caught on, and, the, and I can't imagine why. So, <laughs> so this is a non-digestible, non-absorbed fat. Yep. So this is a non-digested, non... <laughs> yeah, so they take potato chips and fry them in this. Okay, so they fry them. So if it's not absorbed, it won't provide nine calories per gram. It means that it is going to pass through you. And if you eat it in very small amounts, then most of the time it doesn't cause an issue. But the problem comes into play when somebody is like, these are delicious, and they eat an entire bag of chips that have been fried in Olestra, and all that mess is just going to run slam through you. And yes, you can have uncontrollable anal leakage. <laughs> and so because of that, and there's like even things that say on the bag, like, warning, <laughs> do not eat too much of this. Huh? That's a big deal. That was hysterical. There is even a diet supplement called Ally, the same thing. So Ally was a supplement that actually bound, it bound, it would bind fat and block absorption. So all that fat would just run right through you. And I'm like, just stop eating the fat, for God's sake. But that would be the difference. The thing is, in the right amounts, these fats are very healthy. I mean, you need these fats. Yes, in the right amounts. But for somebody that is trying to lose weight, when you're looking at nine calories per gram versus four, then you may be, you may be going into that option of, well, I'm going to go with all these low fat options because they have half the number of calories and then avoid the fats. And by doing that, I'm gonna reduce my total calorie intake and that'll help to reduce weight, okay? So there's ver then that has been kind of like the traditional diet for like the last 50 years, right? The low fat diets. And so you lowered fat, you cut out fat and you eat nothing like but salads and like lean meat and that's it. <laughs> okay. And so we'll talk again. There's like kind of this keto diet interest that has come in and that's actually eating larger than normal amounts of fat, not Olestra though. So Olestra, that can cause some complications. <laughs> dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But it is non-caloric because it's not digested, so it doesn't get absorbed. So it passes straight, straight through your GI tract, just like fiber, okay? Fiber, the fibrous cover on seeds, that doesn't get digested, it doesn't get absorbed, and so it all just adds bulk as it passes through. And we'll talk about that in Chapter 6, okay? So when thinking about rates of reactions, so like I said, sometimes this book just likes to throw a topic right in the middle and then go back to what they were talking about before. So when you talk about activation energy and how you have to make sure that molecules collide and that they have the right orientation to be able to react, you can affect the rate of the reaction by changing how often they collide. Does that make sense? So if I make things collide more often, is that going to increase the odds they'll react? Absolutely. Yeah. Like if you think about it, that's sort of a common sense type. And if I can make sure they align in the right orientation, 
Wouldn't that increase the rate? Wouldn't that increase and make them react faster? So here's their examples. I like this because this is like, you tell me. <laughs> so here is the little red ball. We're going to say this is A. The little blue one is B. And the little red one and blue one is AB. So that's the product. So I want A plus B making C or making AB in this one. A plus B makes AB. Just start with each, just start with each beaker. Don't go to the green one yet. <laughs> so in this first one, can you see in this first one, this is sort of normal. So A and B are in these two jars and they're floating around. They're floating around, they're bouncing. But then A and B combine at the right orientation and you end up with a product. So you can see that? So what happens in B? Why? Yes. So if you increase temperature, what does that make molecules do? Mm -hmm. So it's going to increase vibrational activity or movement of the reactants. And if they're moving faster, they're going to hit each other more. And if they collide more, they're going to react faster. So we can increase the temperature. In fact, that's what we did in lab today. So for the night people, you haven't done it yet, but you will. And so in this, in order to make aspirin, we mixed our compounds and we had to do what? Heat it, okay? We had to put it in a boiling water bath. So you clamped it and you lowered it down. And so that heat from that boiling water was absorbed by the reactants. If we didn't do this, the reaction would still occur. It just would take hours. So we don't have time for that. So we need to like make sure that it happens in a time span that we can do it to our lab. <laughs> so we're going to add heat. And so that helped to speed it up. Do you think that it raises or lowers the activation energy? Yeah, because it makes those molecules have higher energy. So remember in our little, our little here, right? Whether it's like that or if it's exergonic or endergonic, remember that our, our reactants have an energy level. So if we heat them, their energy level will be higher. So that's going to make our activation makes energy smaller. smaller. Exactly. Huh? Okay. Does that make sense? You're, you're, you're raising the first the first Yeah. Line so if I raise this right. line, okay. then that's going to make the hill smaller because I'm making these molecules move faster, vibrate faster. So they're not going to require as much energy to get that reaction to occur. Okay. All right. So now you tell me what C is. Yeah. Exactly. So notice in that jar, there's a whole lot more A and B. Oh, yeah. yeah. Have more starting materials. That makes perfect sense. Right? Because are they going to collide more? Oh, absolutely. Compared to A? Compare, if you compare the first beaker to the third, don't you think the ones in the third beaker will run into each other more? Yeah, because they're more dense. They can't help it. Okay, the odds are is that they are going to run into each other a whole lot more because there's a lot more of them to run into each other. So increasing the reactants will help to increase how fast. So rate is speed. Okay, how fast this reaction progresses. So my favorite example for this is starting the grill. <laughs> and I don't start the grill. That's not my job. <laughs> like I'll make everything I do, all the inside cooking it, and I'm like, you go outside and you do the grill. <laughs> Okay, so Jarvis gets all excited because he's all about some charcoal. <laughs> so my idea of charcoal is we start this, you pour some lighter fluid on, you throw the match, you know, and then you go back in the house and you're working on stuff and you come back out and the darn thing went out. Oh, it makes me crazy. It's because of cheap charcoal. That's what it is. <laughs> but you're like, mm. so you know what you do? Yeah, more fluid. Not just some. <laughs> so then you soak it, right? So you're like, all right, I'll fix this. <laughs> okay, I weigh up my reactant. Okay, I use a lot of lighter fluid. Okay, and then when I throw the match, so then I end up with like it's like this big flame that goes halfway up at the wall, and you're like, That's why we have you come to this? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a good example of how increasing reactants increases the speed of that reaction. Okay, I see the reactants and I understand the concept. What is the increased rate? Yep. Talking about the rate of them coming together. If I compare, yes, the rate of them knocking okay. into each other, the rate of their ability to react. So it's not so much orientation. In the first two, we're really just making them run into each other more, right? So B and C, we're just going to make them collide more, okay? But that orientation factor isn't like they might still do this, right? They might not come this way. They may still like sideways glance off of each other. But D, what is D doing? That's right. 
So see the green thing? There's the little green thing. <laughs> so the little green thing's like a holder, okay? This little green thing is the catalyst. So what a catalyst does, um, in, in the part where the machine is adding more reactants, mm -hmm. increase the rate. Um, if you have, does it actually increase the rate per reactant? I mean, if you have 50 of these in a room, uh -huh. if you have 50 more in a room, of course you're going to have more. Uh, so um, it's all about this. More collisions. Right, more and we collisions. said collisions affects the rate. But you also have 50 more. Right, but I'm not looking at numbers. I'm looking at how fast A and B combine. And if they hit each other more often, they're going to react more often. Does that make sense? So I'm not looking at like rate per amount. I'm just looking at the reaction itself. Okay, like A and B combining. So if I have a lot of A and B, then they're going to combine at a faster speed until they start, you start decreasing the amount that are there. So if I need 25 people to collide with each other, mm -hmm. I put uh, 20, 20, 25 people, uh, 50 people in a room. Right. I'm not going to waste. You know, I got no time to waste. Put 100 people in a room. Right, and the yeah. odds are they're going to bounce off each other faster or more often, and that'll be some of them will be optimal collisions, and that'll create your product. So that'll happen more often. So it means at the conclusion you're going to have the number that you want as fast as possible. Correct. You're also going to have a lot of waste or things that would have. Right. Yep. I'm, it's it's that initial. If I want to speed up a reaction, I can change the temperature. I can change the amount of reactants I start with, or I can use a catalyst. So, at a catalyst, what does that catalyst look like? It's doing. It's holding what? Yeah, some of the catalysts look like they're holding A, some of the catalysts look like they're holding B, and then some of them look like they're pushing them, there, that they've got them together. And that is really what a catalyst does, is it brings your reactants together in the right orientation. So it doesn't just sham, you know, slam them together and maybe they bounce off, it actually takes this one and this one and puts them together just the way they need to be. So this is really what's going to affect that orientation. Now, is that more like based on like clarity of the molecules you're working with? Or? Well, let's look. <laughs> so that leads us. That leads us. And these are just theirs. So there's their temperature examples. Do I need to go back? Okay. Uh, when earlier, when you were saying about the temperature, you said that that lowers the oxidation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. It, yeah. Ra it raises the energy of the reactants, and so it can lower the activation energy. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. Because mm -hmm, it just makes the a, the reactants A and B kind of way up here. And so that means that your hill is smaller because they're moving faster. They have more energy. All right, so there's their example. So temperature, we talked about that. And then the amount of reactant, we talked about that. And then this catalyst, okay? So examples. Examples of catalysts like in the everyday world type of thing is there's catalytic converters, and new cars, thank God, new cars, you don't actually end up having to replace these. Old cars, like the cars from the 70s, they were like, you had to replace, they were like kind of new on the market in that time. And it was like every seven or eight years, and they were like $800 because they contain metal. I thought it was, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a super expensive metal, okay? So it's a platinum metal. Gases flow from your engine contain. When gasoline burns, some of the byproducts are the issues. No, that's okay. The problem is, is you end up with carbon monoxide. You end up with benzene. You burn, you end up with um, like small fuel molecules. Like octane can get broken down into two butanes. So you can end up with these small fuel molecules that are not completely combined with oxygen. Those released out into the air, added to smog, added to air pollution, caused all kinds of issues. So they added a catalytic converter, and what that metal does is it reacts with any organic carbon molecules that come by and combine it with oxygen. So it will take carbon monoxide and it'll combine it and make carbon dioxide. 
It'll take benzene, which is an aromatic ring, another thing we talked about in lab today, an aromatic ring, and it'll actually break the ring and then combine it with oxygen and make carbon dioxide. It'll take your small propane, butane, small gaseous fuels that are byproducts of taking big, long carbon chains and breaking them, but not burning them completely, convert them to carbon dioxide. So all that comes out of your tailpipe is carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so that decreased air pollution because before they were doing this in California, there would be days over LA that they had smog warnings and people wouldn't even go outside. I mean, it was like, and you could see it. It was like this crazy layer. People that had asthma, respiratory issues, they couldn't live in those larger cities because of how much of this unburned fuel gas molecules were in the air. So for us in the body, we talk about enzymes. Okay, so enzymes are catalysts. They're organic catalysts, which means that they contain carbon. So they are mostly made of proteins. If we didn't have enzymes, we would not be able to exist in this multicellular form because we would never be able to respond to changes in our environment to maintain homeostasis. We would never be able to respond fast enough. Sort of like our, we made aspirin, and I told you, if we didn't add the catalyst, it would take about 110 minutes of boiling this sample to make our aspirin. But since we add the catalyst, it's done in about 15 minutes. Okay, So it helps to speed reactions up greatly. Same thing. So what enzymes do is they take reactants, and they bind to them, and then they put them together, or they promote their breaking by creating the correct orientation. So that is really where that orientation aspect comes into play. They're extremely specific. So one enzyme might work on this specific reactant, but it may not work on another one. And we'll actually do a lab later in the semester looking at enzymes, what they call specificity, how exact are enzymes and how they work. So here's the picture that I like to draw. Oh, here we go. So if, you had a, if you've had an AMP class for me, I'm sure you've seen the sideways E. <laughs> Okay, so for me, this squiggly looking spirally thing, that's an enzyme. So it looks like it's laying down E. So it's this thing. And it actually has a three-dimensional shape. And that three-dimensional shape is significant, much like a lock and a key. Okay, so the shape is significant because the enzyme's shape allows it to interact with reactants. In this case, we want to take A and B and we want to make C. The shape of A looks like A, looks like this one. The shape of B is a little different. So molecules, kind of we were talking about things that are chiral, how you get handedness. Molecules do not have the exact same shape. It depends on what they're made of. But so the shapes of reactants are not going to be exactly the same. So the enzyme binds to specific reactants and notice when it binds, that causes the enzyme to actually change its orientation. So when A and B are combined, the reactant changes shape itself. So that induces a shape change in the enzyme, and that puts A and B together in the right orientation. So the orientation becomes the biggest play, because not only do we want to bring them together, we want to make sure that they're in the right orientation to react. Because if they were this way, they wouldn't. If they were this way, they wouldn't. They have to be just like this in order for the reaction to occur between them. And so in that one, they end up making C. And what's great about an enzyme, as soon as the enzyme finishes this reaction, it releases the product and it can do it again. So enzymes and other catalysts don't get used up. They can do this over and over and over. Now enzymes wear out because enzymes are proteins. Okay, so they do eventually, with all this moving around, moving around, they wear out, but we can actually make them. So we synthesize proteins in the cell, depending on what the body needs, in order to speed up reactions. <laughs> Digestion, here's an example. So in your mouth, you have saliva. So saliva has an enzyme to begin to digest starch. So once you put bread or you put a potato or you put some pasta in your mouth, so you start chewing, that starchy material gets combined with saliva. There is an enzyme called amylase that begins to break that starch into smaller polysaccharides, smaller and smaller pieces of sugars. 
eventually it'll get completely digested when it gets down into your small intestine but you start digestion there so it's really getting digested the whole time it's traveling down your esophagus all the way to your stomach now your stomach acid pretty much kills that amylase so it doesn't do much anymore but then in your stomach you have a whole nother group of enzymes that digest protein so the protein in your eggs the protein in the meat and the hamburger that you ate so that protein enzymes begin to work on those proteins to break them down into smaller pieces down into those amino acids. If we didn't have these enzymes, these molecules would be too big. We would never get them small enough to absorb. We would never be able to generate energy from them. Okay? So it's estimated that the human body has about 25,000 different enzymes. Mm -hmm. So lots of different enzymes, and many of them are extremely specific in what they digest. So the one in saliva digests starch, the one from your stomach digests proteins. And they don't work on the other nutrients. They're very specific in what they actually work for. But look at the speed. So they're going to make reactions speed up about a million fold. So something that would have, caught, would have taken a million seconds now only takes one. So that much faster. So it causes reactions because it can take these and put them together and then drops them. Takes these, put them together. Or it takes them and splits them apart takes them and splits them apart. And if you're waiting for that to randomly happen, they might not be very spontaneous. But enzymes can help make reactions that are not very spontaneous on their own much more spontaneous by lowering the activation energy. So when looking at the chart, nope, it doesn't have it. So remember in our energy in and out, and we'll just use exer exergonic as the example. So remember if we have A and B, and we want to make C. We have that activation energy. What does an enzyme do? Mm -hmm. So remember that this is the normal. So that is the normal energy. ACT, like the energy of activation is what they usually like to call it. But if I add an enzyme, that's going to make that hill half as big because the enzyme's going to remove the fact that we're waiting for them to collide, we're waiting for them to become in the right orientation, because the enzyme does that for you. So when we add an enzyme, it's going to take and drop this here. So now our activation energy with the enzyme is much, slow, much lower than what it otherwise would be. So it's a much smaller hill it's going to mean that the reaction is going to happen at a much faster rate. We don't have to put as much energy in to get it to go. So like I told you that we have well, roughly 25,000 different enzymes and that they speed these up by factors of a million times or more, what happens when you don't have an enzyme? What happens when you're missing one? So here's some examples of diseases, genetic diseases, that are due to improper enzymes. Most of the time, it means it's a genetic disease, so the DNA that is used to make this enzyme has a mutation. So it has an error in it, and since it has an error, it's not going to make the enzyme that is needed. So some of them are just very inconvenient. So if anybody in here is lactose intolerant, so if you're lactose intolerant, this means that you don't make the enzyme called lactase. And that is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. And lactose is found where? It's found in all milk products. So if you can't break down lactose, you eat the cheese, you drink the milkshake, okay? And it's like delicious, yes. And then, and then in an hour you're like, I don't feel so good. <laughs> and then in two hours you're like, oh, the pain. <laughs> Wondering what in the world. I mean, I had friends that had like serious lactose intolerance and would have like terrible cramps, like like laying on the bed, cur curl up in a ball type of cramps. Okay, because they don't make this enzyme. Well, lactose is a sugar. Okay, it's just a disaccharide, but it's not big enough to be absorbed. You have to digest it. You have to take this disaccharide and split it into the simple monosaccharide to absorb it. That comes from your pancreas, okay? So the enzyme lactase is secreted by your pancreas into the small intestine. So as that milk sugar passes by, the enzyme gets dumped in. 
And so, in the early part of the small intestine, lactose gets split into the disaccharides and gets sucked in and absorbed into your bloodstream, okay? If you make this enzyme. If you don't make this enzyme, then that means that sugar is not broken down and it's not absorbed, and it just keeps going. And when it gets to the end of the small intestine, where does it go? What's at the end of your small intestine? The large intestine. And what lives in your large intestine by the billions? Bacteria. Yeah, bacteria. Okay, so you have a whole gut population in your large intestine, and the large intestine bacteria, they love it. Okay, they're like, ooh, lactose. And guess what they do? They ferment it. So they actually break down lactose and use it for energy, and they grow and divide, and they're super happy. Their byproducts are acids, acids that irritate the lining of the large intestine. That causes cramping, okay? also produces a lot of gas because when bacteria ferment stuff, they like to make carbon dioxide. And so that creates the bloating. So you're like, you feel like every, like, I feel like my abdomen should be sticking out to here. And that is because your large intestine, which is normally only about an inch and a half, is feeling like it's been stretched to about two and a half inches in diameter. And that's because of that. So then, once that lining gets irritated, your large intestine resolves irritation by dumping water into the tube and flushing it all out. And that causes what? So that causes diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that causes loose stool. The bloating is because of the gas. Then that gas has to come out, so that's gonna make you fart, okay? So you feel because of that, because of all that pressure, then you're like, oh, I feel awful. Like you will feel kind of nauseous. All that cramping, that's because of the acids. And it's all because of the bacteria. They'll digest your lactose just fine. So when you become lactose intolerant, and some babies are born lactose intolerant, and then some people are lactose intolerant, and then they get over it, and then some people become lactose intolerant as they get older, and then some people have been lactose intolerant their whole life. <laughs> and so why do you care about lactose? Like, why do you care about milk products? It's because of the calcium, okay? So the interest in milk products is because of the calcium, because we are animals, but we do not gnaw on a lot of bones. Okay, so like my dogs, like I can give them a steak bone and they'll like go off and like <laughs> and crunch it and chomp it and swallow it and everything. And they actually get calcium from that. Okay, so animal carnivores would eat meat and bone and they would get their calcium from that. But do we do that? No, no you're like nibble. You like to get your boneless chicken. Now you're like, I don't even want to know there's a bone in there. <laughs> okay, so that means that we don't get a lot of calcium from any kind of like a bone product. So that's why people drink milk still. And we're like the only animal that does that, that actually ingests milk throughout the entire lifetime. Other mammals, when they wean, they're done. Like dogs, cats, like you're really not supposed to give cats milk because their GI tract doesn't, is more intolerant. Mm -hmm. When they're kittens, they're fine. And you're supposed to give them kitty cat, baby kitten milk, but not when they're adults because they really do become lactose intolerant, just like us, just like a lot of people. So what can you use instead? Ooh, almond milk. Okay, you can go to almond milk, so that's kind of become like a new big thing. Soy milk, almond milk. Have you seen lactate? Yeah. Okay, have you seen the cow? The, yeah, the cow commercial? Yeah, man, it's just like milk, you know. <laughs> yes. So what they do is they take regular milk and they add this enzyme. And they incubate it for about 20, 30 minutes, and then they just chill it and move on. Uh-huh. So it's just milk with the lactose already digested. So some people say it tastes a little sweeter just because lactose is a very bland sugar and it splits it into glucose and galactose. So some people say it's a little bit sweeter than just regular milk. But other than that, there is no other thing that's been changed. <laughs> Why are dairy farmers so angry about that? They want Congress to make Oh, milk. no, it's not dairy farmers that are angry about lactate. They say they, don't, they want to know about the They're farmers. mad about almond milk. Yeah, because almond milk is made from almonds. There's no cows involved in that deer. <laughs> so, yeah. And so some of it is price. And milk and almond milk have kind of like become like battling like trying to like keep their prices like about equal so that people are not going to the almond milk as an option. So that one's kind of in like, well, that's sort of annoying. But now some of these other ones, ones like albinism. 
So albinism is when you're missing an enzyme called tyrosinase. And tyrosinase is used in making the pigment for the skin. So this pigment's called what? Melanin. Okay, so you have melanocytes, you have skin cells that are in responsible for making melanin. And if you are lacking the gene or your gene is mutated, so you don't make a functional enzyme to make that pigment, then you're lacking pigment. And so what does their skin look like? Super pale, right? So like white, what about their hair? Clear. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's almost like clear. It kind of gets like a almost like a yellowy kind of haze to it, but it's actually no pigment in the hair, no pigment in the skin. Where else are they oftentimes missing pigments? In the eyes. Their eyes will be red. Okay? So like a true albino, have you ever seen a white bunny rabbit? Okay? They have pink eyes. And the reason they have pink eyes is because they don't have any pigment at all. So you're like, oh, that's not a big deal. What are they at really high risk for? Um, skin, cancer. skin cancer because what does melanin do yeah it's a UV blocker melanin is a natural sunblock so the more pigment you have the better protected you are from sunblock yes so the pale and pasty people you're the ones that are gonna end up risking the sun skin cancers you're the ones that go out and you like burst into flames like my my kids their dad's Scottish and Irish and like my younger child she is so fair so so fair complected so she is paler than me she isn't like when she goes out it's like you're slapping like spf 50 on her <laughs> she goes in the water gets out put some more on <laughs> because she has blistered like blistered sunburned and that's just because you weren't like reapplying it every 45 minutes it was it's terrible much greater risk of skin cancer what about people that are where it just peels? Is that like where the pigment pigment losses in patches? Yeah. Do they? So there's got to be. It's almost like a like a reverse mole because you know, like if you get a mole, it can sometimes increase in the amount of pigmentation, and it may or may not have any challenge to it. But that's where like you get this loss of pigmentation over time. But that's not overall. There's got to be. It's either like a. Yeah, but then you would think that they would just be lighter skin. You know, you would think they'll get, if they were not producing as much melanin, they would get lighter and lighter over time. But they like end up with like patches of no pigment and patches of dark pigment or regular pigment for them. I don't really know that much about that one, but this one, that's the big concern. So looking at these ones, these two down here, unfortunately, they're fatal if not caught, if not treated. And one of them, every single one of you in here was tested for. It is called PKU. So phenylketonuria is what it's called. And it's when you lack an enzyme to be able to break down a very common amino acid found in proteins. It's a genetic disorder. And so when you have a baby, they do a heel stick. Okay, so maybe if you had a baby, like he came home and they had a Band-Aid on their heel. <laughs> and that is because they did a heel stick and this was one of the things, and it's an automatic test. Like it's kind of like when you go for your prenatal check, they like automatically check you for STDs. And they're like, we're just gonna assume you, you know, maybe you, you've got one. <laughs> it's better to check you now and know if we have to do like a, if we have to like, if you can do a vaginal delivery, if we're gonna have to do a C-section. Okay, it's just better to know now and not to be surprised later on. Same thing here. So when baby's in the hospital, part of the newborn is to actually pull blood and they check for this enzyme. So they can test the blood to see if that enzyme's present. So it's a pro it's a, the ability to break down a certain amino acid in a protein. And so if this enzyme is lacking, then it ends up like at six weeks, baby's fine. So baby goes home, happy, good like good weight, activity, APGAR scores were good, no obvious deficiencies. At six weeks, things seem okay. But then when you go for those 10 to 12 week checkups, you're starting to see delays. So baby's not thriving, baby's not moving, baby's not doing as much of the reflex activity because it begins to actually cause that amino acid builds up to toxic levels and that inhibits neurological development. And so if it's not treated, that can end up leading to permanent mental retardation and death. So that's why they do the heel stick. So now somebody that has PKU, it's not really an issue because they tell the mother or parents and so they know to put them on a diet that is low in proteins containing that amino acid. And so you purposely then stay away from certain proteins because they're higher in phenylalanine. And that's why they don't drink Diet Coke. 
Because if you look on the back, if you look on the back, you'll see that it has phenylketonuric contains phenylalanine. <laughs> Do you see it? Uh -huh. So that notification is because it has um, aspartame, it has NutraSweet, and NutraSweet, one of the amino acids of NutraSweet is phenylalanine. Okay? And so somebody that it has PKU would avoid anything that's going to have higher, than, higher levels of phenylalanine just throughout their entire lifespan, and then they don't have the issues. So they like this just used to happen. Like every once in a while, you'd have this new baby, and then there was this issue. And so they finally figured out this is because of this genetic deficiency. So the last one is kind of sad because there's nothing you can do for this one. Tay-Sachs is when you're missing another enzyme that is involved in neurological development. So baby is born fine. At six weeks, there's limitation, and then it just progressively gets worse and worse and worse. But Tay-Sachs, there's no, there's no treatment for it. So they do another tech for this because wouldn't you rather know than like not to know that that's, that's all part of like some of your pre, prenatal testing and things like that, especially for high risk mothers and that type of thing. So mental retardation, blindness, it's all because of missing that enzyme means that you're not going to have normal development. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Do you have a Robert Shoe maker? Yeah. Can I talk to you a second? That's all right. All right. So the very last one, and then we'll quit. These are reactions that we have talked about and kind of like looked at in balancing equations. And so these are looking at chemical reactions from what reactants and what products and how they form. So if you have a synthesis reaction, that's really like what we were talking about with enzymes, what we've been talking about with the other ones. And so in this one, remember that if you take A and B and you make C, you have fewer products, more reactants. So I always think of synthesis as building. Okay, lots of pieces, and I'm going to build something bigger. Okay, I'm going to make something more complex. Decomposition is the exact opposite. So in a decomposition reaction, everything's falling apart. Okay, so that's when you got a lot of bit, you got one big thing and you end up with a whole lot of little things. So C is a bigger thing and you end up with smaller little pieces. And like if you think of something decomposing, what do you think of? Rotting and decaying, right? So things are falling apart, pieces are falling off of them. <laughs> so that's never a good plan. So these are all breakdowns. And so these really are opposite of each other. But the key thing with both of these, they don't have the same number of reactants and products. More reactants, synthesis. More product, decomposition. And it doesn't matter. You might have five reactants and one product, or you might have two products and ten reactants. Okay? So you're just going to have, they're not equal in number. So in these, reactants do not equal products. And I'm not talking about like the balanced equation. I'm talking about just like the physical molecules that are involved in the reaction. So they do not equal the products. That's how you're going to look and, and determine if it's synthesis or decomposition. Because the exchange is when you have two reactants and two products. And all they're doing is swapping partners. So they're swapping their partners. So in the first one, I start off with two and I end up with two. I have two reactants and I have two products, but notice in a single displacement, this one, one of the partners gets bumped off, <laughs> okay? So one of the partners gets kicked off, and so you end up starting with a compound and an element, and you end up with a different compound. And a different element. But it's always going to be a compound element pairing. So they call it a single because it's really like a swapping of one pair. Double displacement, it's molecular swinging. Double displacement is what happens when you have partner swapping. So you have two partners and they both swap pairs. Now notice in this, how is A and C 
Those would be those out front. Typically, they're the metals. And notice that when you look at the product, where are they? Are they in, out in front or are they at the back now? They stay out in front, okay? So typically, A and B, this is going to be your metal. This is metal. And so notice, even though they're swapping partners, the metals always list first. So they're going to stay that way. I always tell people, like, think like the outside pairs and the inside pairs combined. So A will combine with D. They're sort of the outside pairs. And then B will combine with C. They're the inside pairs. But C gets listed first in front of B because C is going to be a metal. B is going to be the non-metal. D will be a non-metal. So those ones typically get listed second. So this is, you just look for two different compounds. Two different compounds swapping and making two different compounds. But notice here, reactant number and product number are equal. So it's sort of just those four. So if you look at, not that. <laughs> the balance equations. Wow. <laughs> So what's the first one? So remember with this, just say, okay, I have how many reactant types? How many product types? So what is this? Synthesis, exactly, okay? Not even balancing. Do you see that I have two different kinds of reactants? I have one product. Not even balanced. Just looking at the equation, I have two reactants, one product, it's a synthesis. So what's the second one? Double displacement. Mm -hmm. So notice that you have two compounds. They swap, and I get two new kinds of compounds. Al2CO33 decomposition. You see with that one, I had one reactant, but I get two products. So that one reactant split or decomposed. Remember that synthesis and decomposition are going to have unequal numbers of reactant and product types. Now, what happened in that one? Fe3O4, that's a compound. H2 is an element. Single. Mm -hmm. Single displacement. So it's a single swap. Do you see that this hydrogen basically popped or knocked the iron off? The hydrogen knocked the iron off, forming water, and made the iron all by itself. So here, this is a compound and an element, and I end up with a different compound and a different element. So that's a single. Mg and N2 makes Mg3N2. Synthesis. Cl2 and water make HCl and O2. Single displacement. So I was like, these ones are really pretty easy. You better not mess these up. SN is tin in CL synthesis. Double displacement. Two compounds, swapping pairs, and then the last one, synthesis. Okay? Pretty straightforward, yeah? And it's really just a matter of looking at, okay, how many of the on the reactant side, how many on the product side? Not even balancing. You should be able to go back and balance these. But not even balancing them, just looking at the actual um, elements or compounds, counting the numbers. If they're not equal, synthesis or decomposition. If they're equal, then look, do you have an element and a compound? Then that's a single. If you have two compounds making two compounds, then that's double. All right, so I got another one. We'll do that next time. Or you can work on that one. Quit there. So next time we're going to talk about combustion, oxidation reduction, and then those condensation and addition reactions that we talked about in lab. <laughs>